Good morning, everyone. Jason, just checking my audio. This is Mike. Morning, Mike. You sound good. All right, thanks. Good morning. This is Adam Nowalski. Morning, Adam. You sound good. Thanks very much. I'll be on mute. And Tom Schlichter here. Morning, Tom. You sound good. Great. Thank you. Good morning. This is Kate Welke. Good morning, Kate. You sound good. Thanks. Good morning, Peter Hughes. Good morning, Peter. You sound good. Thank you. Good morning, Chester Brewer. Good morning, Chester. You sound good. Good morning, guys. Scott Lennox checking in. Good morning, Scott. You sound good.
Well, I have nine o'clock, so uh, I think we should go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone back for day two of the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council's October 2021 council meeting. Uh, we're having this meeting via webinar. Um, today is the last day of our meeting, so we're going to finalize. We're going to go through a number of different items that are on the agenda, and we'll conclude with our business session uh, that we typically have on third on Thursdays. But we're going to we're going to wrap things up here by uh, late this later this afternoon. Uh, we're going to start this morning with uh, spiny dogfish specifications review. Uh, Jason is going to run through his presentation, and the council can consider uh, taking actions on 2022 specs, including. And you'll hear this through the presentation, but um, there was some discussion with the committee about increasing the trip limit. Uh, in federal waters, uh, Jason's going to go through the details of that. So keep that in mind as we walk through this. Um, we did, Jason. Uh, we did talk yesterday when you got cut off at the end of the day. Uh, if there was anything else that you wanted to bring up uh, that before you got before your computer went down, um, we thought you could start off with that and then jump into spiny dogfish. But if if you covered everything you wanted to, um, then that's fine too. We just wanted to give you the opportunity. Or I wanted to give you the opportunity to to cover everything you wanted to uh, before we start spiny dogfish this morning. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Jason. If you're ready to go, you can either start with spinies or or go back and cover the things that you were talking about before you got cut off yesterday. Either way is fine with me, but uh, the floor is yours, Jason. Okay, thank you. Uh, yep, I think I was done, so I'm just going to roll into spinies. Excellent. Okay. Okay, so quick review of kind of where we are currently. Um, we're uh, in multi-year specs. The current ABC is about 17,500 metric tons, about 39 million pounds. Um, the quota is about 13,500 metric tons, about 30 million pounds. Um, and the, the gap there is mostly due to um, just accounting for commercial discards is a little bit of a deduction for Canada and, and, and rec catch, but it's mostly commercial discards there. So with that ABC, it's kind of driven by the council's risk policy. The um, expected probability of overfishing for 2021 was about one third, 33% uh, chance of overfishing. So now the council's risk policy allows higher than that, but um, since the stock is below the target, it's a bit more cautionary. Um, and then the SSC extended that same ABC to the 2022 fishing year. Since we have a research track assessment underway, no particular assessment projections. Uh, you know, there was no additional assessment this year. We're really waiting on that research track assessment. So it's an open access fishery and uh, the federal trip limit is 6,000 pounds. Quick, uh, we didn't get a data update from the center given there's a research track and we didn't ask for one. It was just kind of a plan. We have a research track assessment ongoing, but they did provide uh, just an update of the survey. No survey in 2020. This is the spring uh, trawl survey by the center. So the 2021 data point is there, uh, down a bit from 2019, but more or less splitting the difference of the two previous um, 1819. And that data point is likely a bit of an underestimate. Some of the far southern strata were missed in 2021. And given how these are calculated, um, that will kind of artificially depress that number uh, a bit. Uh, just the PUP index. Um, again, same kind of story uh, uh, about in between the two previous uh, data points, but up a little bit from the, the immediately available preceding data point. So just landings and quotas since management. You can see how as the quotas initially came up in the late 2000s, landings kind of tracked that, but then they've been um, you know, depending on exactly what year you start at. Uh, either level or or trailing off um, 
since uh, the 2010s, despite the quota um, being available. That big drop in quota for 2019 was due to an assessment update um, that indicated the stock size was lower. That dropped uh, the, um, the, the ABC, and then the projections allowed um, indicated some increases after that, and then you can see the flat quota for um, the last the, the last two years there. These are just landings for the current fishing year. Fishing year starts May one, are in blue, and the previous year are in that yellow orange. So, you know, starting off with the previous fishing year, you can see is substantially below. Um, uh, the, the the quota, and you know that got really flat at the end of the year. Often there'd be end of the fishing year, which is the winter. Often there'd be uh, substantial vir uh, Virginia landings during that kind of flat period at the end there. Um, but we'll discuss a bit later uh, the Virginia landings, especially were off from the prior year even. Uh, and then this year uh, with the blue, that's really the Massachusetts fishery. Uh, in the summer and early fall, and you can see for the current fishing year, um, those Massachusetts landings are off substantially from, uh, you know, in the current 2021 fishing year compared to the 2020 fishing year. This is dogfish prices, inflation adjusted per pound. Um, you know, 2020 looks pretty similar to 2019. Uh, one task I've um, kind of assume, taken on for the dogfish research track assessment is to do a little bit of data cleaning, um, just scanning through data, looking for outliers. Um, I do see a few things in 2019 that kind of I haven't been able to fully resolve. Um, so um, I'm not, I think that, that there may be some adjustments to that 2019 price um, but uh, it's something um, and there's a lot of uh, records to, to look through. So I'm trying to figure that out. We have had some issues in the past with um, like spiny dogfish parts being um, uh, or whole fish being put in as parts and then they get drastically expanded up in the landings database. We've kind of corrected those in the past. So um, uh, I think there may be some oddities in the 2019 data that haven't fully resolved yet. So the, in our normal process, we take um, kind of the basic fishery performance data to our advisory panel to do their fishery performance report. And um, pretty much similar sentiments as previous years, uh, flagging that markets and the trip limit uh, kind of combined to really restrict landings. The advisory panel noted the uh, you know, still declining participation, um, and they kind of flag from their perspective. It's really increasing fuel costs and opportunities in other fisheries uh, are kind of leading to lower participation. And um, there was uh, some folks at the AP saying that a 10,000 pound trip limit would would help to increase uh, landings and kind of get them back to where they've been in more recent years. Uh, touched a little bit already on 2020. Um, fishing year, so this is really you know, winter 2020 slash 2021. Virginia landings were particularly off. Uh, there's a shrimp fishery that some folks who were spiny dogfish have gotten involved in. Um, been you know, a lot, lot higher price per pound there, and um, also that Virginia fishery in the in the winter is particularly sensitive to weather. Um, they had a, a string of of bad weather, relatively small boats. Um, for the most part, and um, and they're sensitive to weather effects. And then um, for Massachusetts, not from advisor, but from a member of the public, um, they kind of flagged uh, some water temperature issues and availability, folks having trouble finding dogfish at, at different times. Um, so there's at least one processor was requiring um, kind of matched skates with dogfish, and if folks couldn't do that, then um, they were just pursuing other fisheries and some folks were had switched off to, to, to mackerel for uh, a, a bit of time. Um, and then, uh, and then sounds like they had bounced back into dogfish, but 
you know, a variety of issues were cited by um, a member of the public, who I think might be a sector manager involved in one of the sectors up there. They're involved in dogfish as um, some feedback they've been getting from fishery participants about uh, the current ongoing 2021 fishing year. Uh, the advisory panel also flagged some science concerns. Um, there's um, kind of extended discussion of um, concern about Bigelow operations performance, requesting kind of the council kind of call out the, the, the problems um, that the Bigelow has had over in, in recent years and um, kind of uh, negative uh, impacts from that on our ability to discern uh, what the actual trends in dogfish might be. Um, uh, flagging that there have been a number of studies in recent years kind of uh, indicating that dogfish distribution uh, exists outside of the survey area, also in terms of the water column, um, spending a good bit of time uh, um, off the bottom. And what does that mean exactly for um, you know, interpreting the the signals that we see from the trawl survey, um, and then concerns about are we kind of correctly interpreting uh, the kind of the general productivity and fecundity of 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 dogfish. Uh, I'll take a pause. Uh, we just have one quick slide here. Uh, Paul can kind of summarize the SSC's input. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jason. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, I think you're good. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, yeah, the uh, SSC did not have a lot to say about spiny dogfish. Um, they made the obvious statement, of course, that the data gaps, uh, especially the 2020 spring survey, are going to increase the uncertainty of the assessment. But as Jason noted, there are earlier instances where missing strata or incomplete surveys have uh, created some problems. This is particularly acute. Uh, under the current model structure in which the assessment is uh, reliant primarily on the spring survey results. Um, you know, as, as Jason noted, there was some indication of uh, a slight, uh, slightly uh, strong or a, a downward trend in the overall SSB and, and no real evidence of a strong year class in 2021. Um, pup indices of abundance are, are notoriously um, difficult uh, in one sense because um, the uh, uh, newly born um, uh, pups are, are more pelagic than uh, the, uh, uh, the adults. So the timing of the survey can, can be an important factor in terms of the, the magnitude of those indices. Um, but there are uh, signals that the overall stock is, is uh, declining to some extent. Um, the, the research track, uh, of course, will be uh, completed sometime in uh, 2022. Um, the SSC did have some recommendations on uh, ex doing some uh, collaboration with, with Canada on, on aging methods, that is, uh, the spines uh, are now... Uh, the preferred method for um, estimating uh, ages. Uh, it's gone back and forth over the years in terms of which one is better, um, you know, with spines or vertebrae. But um, in either instance, the, the, the most recent aging data that, that have been used in the assessment are over 40 years old. So it's probably time for an update. Um, the alternative modeling that uh, is, is being uh, uh, used for the, uh, the current assessment um, has considerable promise and, uh, and that uh, we're, we're anxious to look forward to its completion. Um, at, the, at the bottom line though, is that there was really not any information, uh, sufficient information to recommend a change uh, either up or down in the, in the survey. So uh, SSC did not recommend any changes to the current uh, uh, ABC. Um, thanks a lot. Back to you, Jason. Um, maybe, Mike, do you want to just take a quick pause to see if any council members have any questions of Paul before we move on? Sure. Yeah, we can do that. Um, 
Does anyone from the council have any questions they'd like to ask of Paul on his SSC report? Is there anyone from the public that would like to ask a question of Paul on his SSC report? James Fletcher. Go ahead, James. Dr. Rago, you stated that the population was in a decline. But since we have not done any surveys on the males outside of 100, 110 phantoms, wherever the big open survey, how can you make such a statement? The male population has not been fished except 10% since 1976. And if these fish live 30, 35 years, how can that statement be made? Perhaps it would be better to say the female population. I have pushed to get a male fishery in and nobody wants to do it. But how can that statement be made as scientific from the SSE, not from you personally, but from the SSE? Oh. How could such a statement be made? Thank you, sir. Sure, yeah, yeah, thank you, James. Uh, your, your clarification is important and, and is correct. Uh, the SSB that is uh, presented here is female spawning stock biomass uh, and most other Finfish uh, uh, stock assessments, spawning stock biomass is um, presented as the joint uh, uh, male and female um, uh, stock biomass. So uh, in this instance, um, it, it is female only, and that I uh, should have been more specific in terms of referring to uh, the spawning stock biomass being related to females. Um, you're correct that uh, uh, that uh, male biomass, uh, male the fishing mortality on on males has been has been low uh, ever almost ever since the stock has been uh, exploited. Um, that is due to their offshore uh, abundance distribution, which is uh, you know they they are are much more common at the shelf break, and as experimental evidence, uh, particularly tagging, indicate they do uh, range outside the um, uh, survey area. So uh, the as uncertain as the female spot uh, biomass uh, is, the male biomass is uh, is is probably uh, even more uncertain. So. Uh, thanks. Hope I've answered that that question. I, as far as the policy related to male only fishery, um, we've discussed this a lot, of course, over the years. Uh, and uh, you know, a lot of it relates to feasibility uh, and uh, and mixture of males and females, and how that might be prosecuted. But um, that that's a more than I can probably get into at this point, or people would want to hear anyhow. So, but anyhow, thank thank you for the comment and thank you for the clarification. All right, thanks, James. Uh, thanks, Paul. Anyone else from the public have any questions for Dr. Rago? Okay, seeing no hands at this time. Um, thanks, Paul, for your report. Let's go ahead back to Jason. Um, for his final uh, slides, and then we'll have a discussion about um, how we want to move forward as a council. Go ahead, Jason. Thank you. Um, so, as kind of part of the specs process, did a little extra look at um, the trip limits, trying to use price as an indicator of um, this was kind of one of the topics that was potentially up for some of the kind of SSC, socio econ kind of collaboration. Um, and then kind of in talking to some of the science center folks who potentially could have been involved with that and they said one way you could look at is you know look at the price before and after the trip limit changes uh doing that it didn't seem like um you know at least using price and that's you know a, a limited way to look at things um and including you know coast-wide to get some discussion at the committee level that there may have been some some more Kind of regional effects and trip limits imposed by processors on fishermen when trip limits started to change, and you know, it's um, weren't looking at 
at, at that level of uh, of detail. But looking coast wide, there didn't seem to be any substantial price effects um, apparent from the two most recent changes, at least. Um, at the committee, there was some discussion um, that some additional descriptive info on recent trips might be useful um, to the council um, in terms of you know what have trips been like recently. Might you know a trip limit be expected to kind of change behavior? A trip limit change be expected to change behavior in the fishery. So um, I just had a, a couple uh, descriptive slides here. Um, okay, so this is not um, the data that was in the price analysis because that was looking at you know 2014 and previous years, um, but. I looked at just the 2019 and 2020 fishing years. So there are about 8,200 8, trips with some federal permit. Um, and, 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 and not since the spiny dogfish permit can be um, picked up or dropped um, to some degree, uh, you know, identifying on each day who has which permit is um, a more complex analysis, but just looking at vessels that had federal permits of some sort, at least, um, and trying to get a sense of, of, of what their trips are like. So this, and I've got a few slides that basically all describe the, the, the same data in a couple different ways here. So this is just a scatter plot here. Each dot is one of those 8,215 trips. And it starts on the left. Um, May 1, 2019 are those first dots that occurred at the start of the 2019 fishing year. At the far right are the last trips in the 2020 fishing year, like April 30, 2021. Um, and, you know, it's just, I, I just picked one random dot in the middle there um, and just went and found, um, you know, what was the date of that trip? It was June 27, 2020, just to, you know, it gives you a kind of a sense of, um, you know, just the, the, the scatter of trips that, 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 that you see in the fishery and you can, you know, see it gets very dark at that, uh, 6,000 pound trip limit, um, and, and close to it. And, and I think it's a, a kind of a good indication that that trip limit likely is having, you know, a pretty strong res restraining effect, um, to, you know, to, to, to some degree, I can see kind of a smattering of dots above that. Uh, different states have um, have other trip limits, and um, and so you know that's that's where those are coming from. These vessels may have had some other federal trip limit, per, other federal permit, just not a spiny dogfish permit. Um, so those trips aren't necessarily illegal, um, and um, but that's. The, it's it's easiest to identify trips um, if they have at least some federal permit. It gets a little hairier with 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 others, and and this is like ninety three percent of the landings are accounted for um, in these eight thousand two hundred fifteen trips. So that's kind of one way. Now, same data, um, just from a little different perspective. I just sorted the trips largest to smallest, um, and then said, okay, how you know what kind of trips account for most of the landings. And so on the far left over here, um, again, I sorted them first, largest to smallest. So this first vertical line here on the left, um, the trips to the left of that line were more than 6,000 pounds, and they represented about 4% of landings. So trips greater than 6,000 pounds, 4% um, of landings. Then this next area here, and I'll kind of hopefully that little flashing. So in this area um, is all the trips, and this is really not a line, but a series of all those dots sorted, all those trips sorted, largest to smallest. So all the trips between 5,800 pounds and 6,000 pounds, uh, they represent 37% of all the landings. Um, and so 37 plus the other four, now we're up to 41% cumulative are 58 or greater, 5,800 pounds or greater. Um, and then the next chunk here, um, kind of in this area here, these are trips that were between 5,000 pounds and 5,800 pounds. And that's about a quarter of the landings 
are in that 5,000 to 5,800. And now we're at 66% of all landings of all these federal landings, which are like 93% of all landings um, are 5,000 pounds or greater. And then um, when you kind of, so we've accounted for two thirds of all the landings basically are by this 5,000 pounds or greater trips. And then this, you can kind of see, you get smaller and smaller trips. They represent, um, you know, a, a, a slow, a, a smaller and smaller chunk getting to 100%. So all these other trips out here just are about a third of the landings. Um, and so one other kind of way, again, I'm just, just kind of describing the exact same data here in a couple of different ways. Um, so this is the same 2019, 2020 trips, the same 8,000, um, 8,215 trips. I just, um, you know, create a little histogram of, you know, how many trips were in these different categories, um, you know, up to a thousand pounds, 1,000 to two, two to three, three to four, four to five, 5,000 to 6,000 pounds and 6,000 plus. And these are just counts of how many trips. So. You know, so certainly the plurality of trips, the single greatest bin here is in this 5,000 to 6,000 pound range. Um, and that 62% of all the landings occur on these, you know, 3,200 trips uh, that are between 5,000 pounds and 6,000 pounds. Um, so that's most of the trips as a count are in that 5,000 to 6,000 bin, um, and they represent 62% of all the landings. Um, so again, just giving folks a, a, a flavor of how, um, of, the, of, of the characteristics of trips in the last two fishing years, 2019 and 2020 fishing years. And, you know, I, I think the, the, the one that kind of, to me tells the story clearest is, is this first one, how, you know, you have that hard line right at 6,000 pounds um, as an indication that, you know, as um, you, know, you don't know how, you know, people are going to take advantage. Certainly when I looked at the other, um, you know, at these other trip limit changes back in 14 and 16, um, you see people taking advantage of the increase almost immediately, um, but not everyone and not every trip um, either. So it gets, you know, very hard to predict given you know, the markets and and you know our and, and price affecting you know markets is an ex vessel price incentivizing people to go fish for dogfish is really the ultimate driver here. Um, but you know given the use of the higher trip limit at the last two changes, um, given there's a lot of activity very close to the trip limit right now, you would expect um, to see people take advantage of that. And, you know, whether it's just existing trips, um, you know, not discarding, you know, more fish because it allows this gill net. So they kind of have to stop um, and, um, you know, they may haul, haul nets a little differently. You know, they're really trying to hit, hit their trip limit there. Um, so might not necessarily create extra effort. Um, may create some extra trip or more, I think, you know, part of the discussion at the AP was that, um, you know, the higher trip limit might um, re-incentivize -incentiv some vessels who had kind of stopped participating to start participating. So again, the, the exact, um, you know, behavior that you'd expect at a higher trip limit is you know, going to be somewhat uncertain, but it seems like it's likely to be taken advantage of to some degree. Um, so for the spine and dogfish monitoring committee, uh, we have two, um, in this FMP two ex officio non voting industry members on the monitoring committee. Um, and their recommendation at the monitoring committee was to double the trip limit to 12,000 pounds through an emergency action, um, to, you know, try to increase some landings, um, incentivize a return to the somewhat higher participation levels as seen in recent years. And I think a lot of the discussion was that uh, um, this is an effort to preserve markets um, and uh, kind of you know stop the the, the decline of participation in, in, in landings that we've seen in recent years. 
The um, other monitoring committee folks are concerns are more kind of process oriented. In terms of the trip limit, you know, the monitoring committee has been pretty consistent over the years saying that as long as we're adhering to the overall ABC ACL, the different trip limits really shouldn't negatively affect stock size. Um, as long as you know, if the ABCs and ACLs are 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 sufficiently protective of the stock, you know, the trip limit shouldn't matter that much biologically as long as you're holding to those ABCs ACLs. However, the size of you know any contemplated change in a trip limit kind of dictates whether it'd be most appropriate to pursue um, you know, a change via specifications, or is it such a substantive change to the fishery that it'd be better to do it via a framework in terms of um, public notice and common opportunities. Um, and, and also if, you know, depending on the impacts that any change might lead to, you know, determines what the appropriate NEPA document, um, supporting NEPA documents might be. Uh, it sounds like at the committee level, at the committee, um, you know, in terms of a, a moderate change, uh, there may be some expedited NEPA type documents that would facilitate, um, you know, kind of a, a change through specifications not being an overly burdensome um, process. Uh, there was some discussion of, you know, the applicability of an emergency rule. I think um, in general, the nature of the discussion was that given this has been kind of an ongoing topic of discussion year after year, that um, likely um, kind of eliminates it from being emergency action, emergency rule type thing. Um, and when when you look at kind of the criteria for emergency rules, um, that's my sense. Uh, Garfo can expand on that um, if I have that wrong or correct or expand as necessary. Uh, so there was a staff recommendation in the briefing documents that was just keep things status quo, um, given the uncertainties about th what the assessment results are gonna be, given the limited public input on trip limit changes, um, staff recommendation was status quo. Um, you, know, I'll, you know, there was, if you read the ABC memo to the SSC, you know, staff does have some concern um, when you look at the trend in landings, uh, look at the trend in the survey, um, and all else being equal, assessments often, when they're digesting a downward trend in a primary survey and a downward trend in landings at the same time, um, that you know, depending on the age structure and all the other factors in the assessment, um, you know, that can sometimes start to raise some flags and no idea how the assessment's gonna work out at this point, um, but, you know, those the, those two trends at the same time um, cause some concern by staff. Um, and, you know, not, you know, we've gotten a lot of um, input over the years on in, um, kind of interest and in stability in this fishery and, you know, some concern about, you know, having to, um, have kind of yo-yo reactions um, in, uh, you know, if depending on the outcome of that assessment. So again, kind of the staff memo kind of flagging that emergency action seems like unlikely, um, an unlikely route uh, given the input from Garfo and staff's understanding of the criteria for emergency action. Um, specifications usually deals with smaller changes for spiny dogfish um, and um, and we've had some, you know, 20, 25% uh, increases in the trip limit through the specs process in, um, in recent years. Gen generally, it's a May 1 target for, um, for, for enacting uh, changes via the specifications. However, um, you know, the last few times um, when there have been trip limit changes through specs, um, it's kind of dragged out later than that, but May 1 is generally the specs uh, target. Uh, framework, you know, can always evaluate a, a wide range of options, also facilitates public awareness, but takes longer and the two councils have to agree on, um, on changes made via a framework. While with specifications, if the two councils disagree, NIMS has a lot of flexibility to, um, 
to come up with some kind of solution. They can pick one, the other, split the difference. Uh, there's a lot of flexibility for NIMPs to resolve differences if there are differences among the between the recommendations made by the New England and the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council for this jointly managed species. A uh, quick assessment update. Um, Paul touched on this a bit. We've had two meetings so far. Um, where um, you know, the, the center is evaluating resources to to do some um, aging of some spines that we have to re-examine the growth information. Uh, the council and SSC research recommendations have been kind of highlighted um, to the assessment uh, working group, and they include kind of you know looking at the the, the aging and, and and growth information, and it's really just kind of um, you know in the in the starting phases of the assessment. It's a July review, and then we'll go into the management track process, and then be available for some ABCs and using hopefully a new assessment approved assessment document to set future abcs in the fall of 2022 uh, so there were two committee motions uh, that were um, passed uh, unanimously out of committee save from um, abstention from the nims member of the committee um, the committee uh, moved to recommend to the councils that they adopt a trip limit increase to 7,500 pounds via um, the most expedient process possible. Again, NIMS can't exactly determine the um, optimal NEPA document until they see what the recommendation actually is and some preliminary evaluation of impacts. There's some sense that some expedited NEPA process is possible. However, um, we also discussed at the monitoring committee and committee that um, you know, there are additional pressing protected resource concerns. Um, there's a new phase of take reduction um, underway that's looking at um, other gears, including gill net. So how that process works out, but with the new biological opinion um, for um, all the mid-Atlantic species, uh, that has to be integrated even to a, 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 an, a smaller NEPA document, and um, that's going to take a little extra time, but um, we tried to do it as expedited as possible. And then the second committee motion was um, that the council then prioritize a framework to consider additional trip limit changes, but with work beginning after the completion of the research track assessment to you know, get, get, you know, not not start work um, before those um, those results are known. And that's it for me. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jason, uh, for your presentation. Let's see if members of the council have any questions for Jason regarding um, what he presented to us. Anybody have any questions? Okay, I don't see any hands at this time. Um, let's go to the public. Anyone from the public have any clarifying questions they'd like to ask of Jason um, before we take on the um, setting the specs accordingly? James Fletcher, go ahead, Jim. Jason, and this is for the uh, NOAA attorney. If NOAA did not have a male trip limit in the EEZ, would the interstate commerce com laws allow the fish to be landed and trucked through a state where the state could not have a trip limit? In other words, if you caught the fish in federal waters and were sending them to a state that did not have dogfish on its management, would interstate commerce allow them to be taken from federal waters into that state and the port that they were passing through, could they interfere with it? That's a question in the future for a NOAA attorney. The second question to Damon, I mean to Jason, what difference would 100,000 pounds make 
as far as the amount of landings. Are most of the landings in the northern states that bump up right now against the 6,500 pound limit, or are they in the southern states? It wasn't clear whether where most of the landings that bump up against the trip limits are. So I guess the second question is, where are most of the landings that bump up against the trip limits? Thank you. I don't know if uh, GC can address the first part of that question. Um, I'm not sure I can, but I'd, I'd ask Mr. Fletcher for a little clarification on his on his question. Is the question the, the fact pattern that you laid out is one with where there is federal trip limits, but a state doesn't allow landings of any kind? Is that the question? No, the state has a trip limit. We'll say 6,500 pounds right now. But if an industrial fishery developed that wanted to land 100,000 to 300,000 pounds, come through, offload in the state, and then truck them to another state that does not have it, would the state that it was going through be able to interfere with the catch. In other words, interstate commerce, you can go through a state with a tractor trailer carrying a product that's not allowed in that state as long as the truck doesn't stop in that state. So I'm just trying to lay the groundwork for a male fishery two to four years from now and get all the things straightened out of whether you could offload in a state and it not be regulated by that state. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, well, um, as to that scenario, Magnuson has provisions whereby a state couldn't, you know, if, if state measures interfere with an FMP, and I think that's kind of what you're getting at is, is state, these sta if there was that fact pattern, the state management would interfere with the goals of the federal FMP, then the Magnuson has provisions by which this, you know, basically the federal fishery would impose measures applicable in the state waters as well. So that's a path forward that could address that that scenario through Magnuson. Okay, sounds, I mean, I think they're already shipping, you know, given how they, they batch trips, I think they're already shipping higher than the state trip limits through states, um, is my understanding. And but it sounds like maybe a little follow up might be needed on that just to make sure we're fully understanding that question. Um, I think on, um, I just, you know, the landings have been kind of split. Um, in recent years between Massachusetts and Virginia. Um, and uh, again, Virginia had a drop off in the last fishing year. Um, I don't, I'm not positive the answer to your question, but I mean, given the nature of landings overall and with just those two states, I think they're going to have to be a lot of, and given the majority of landings are kind of close to the trip limit anyway, I think it's going to have to be both. Um, uh, you know, Massachusetts and Virginia, um, and, you know, seeing trips close to the trip limit, um, is my general sense of the data, but I can't be a hundred percent sure. But again, given where landings are coming from in general, I think it's going to have to be both, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. All right. Thanks for that. Um. And as you said, Jason, maybe there's some follow up that we can do for uh, Mr. Fletcher um, at another time on his question. It gets complicated when you get into the commerce stuff, but um, your points well taken about batching up um, different landings from different fishermen and trucking them across state lines. So uh, it's a little out of my wheelhouse as far as things that I know about. So 
Um, possibly we can get back to, to Jim on that at some point. Um, before we come back to the council, let's, uh, let's see if anyone else from the public has any questions uh, for Jason or Paul on their presentations on dogfish here this morning. All right. I don't see any new hands. Uh, Jim, if you can put your hand down, uh, that'll help me out. And I'm going to bring it back to the council at this time. Uh, I did see Dewey's hand go up, but go, go ahead, Dewey. And then Dan, I'll take you next. Dewey Hemmelright. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. You sound good. Yep. Uh, it, it's my understanding right now, uh, a tractor trailer. It's probably 30,000 pounds of dogfish, and if it left North Carolina, it, it, it goes through the states uh, to the processor. So uh, I don't think there's a problem with interstate commerce there. Uh, it has to do, might would have to do with what the choice the state decides on its trip limit to be landed. Because federal waters is one trip limit, but the state can dictate uh, what trip limit they want in, in uh, their state waters for landings. Exactly. They, do not they do not have to marrow um, the federal trip limit, as uh, I know on a few occasions with different species. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I know some of the southern states. Uh, I know North Carolina, Maryland. I'm not sure about Virginia, but um, I know at least North Carolina and Maryland, we have higher trip limits than the federal waters. But you have to relinquish your fe your federal permit in order to fish in state waters for those higher trip limits, and not everybody always wants to do that. So it creates a little bit of a problem, but um, there is an opportunity for higher trip limits in state waters, at least in, in Maryland, in my state. Um, well, thanks, Dewey. Appreciate that. Uh, Jason, did you have something to add? Yeah, and just to clarify, I think what Mr. Fletcher was contemplating was if you had um, – a trip going into maybe some states south of North Carolina don't have trip limits. Um, and so if you had a 100,000 pound federal trip limit for males in federal waters, could they then go into a, a more southern state and be trucked up through? Um, but anyway, we, we can follow up a bit later if necessary. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, Dan Farnham. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to, to your point, uh, uh, Jason, can you tell us what states do allow a higher trip limit when fishing under a, uh, a non-federal permit? Um, yeah, and this came up at the committee and I don't have it, but I think it's definitely Maryland and North Carolina. I think North Carolina is 20 and I think Maryland is 12. Yep. Okay. Very good. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Um, Adam Nowalski. Thank you very much. Uh, so I know we don't have the motion up yet, but I assume the committee motion is coming before us shortly. Uh, but my question would be that the uh, committee meeting summary, I did not attend the committee meeting, uh, indicated that public comment uh, suggested effort would not be expected to increase compared to recent years. Uh, given a unanimous committee uh, ap approach to this and not having heard anything from my state fishermen, I don't have a reason to oppose that committee motion once it comes forward. Uh, but I am wondering if you might be able to elaborate on if there were any public comments during the committee meeting uh, that were in opposition uh, and what they might have uh, centered on if, in fact, there were comments in opposition to this previous slide. Yeah, thanks, Adam. I, I was able to participate on most of that meeting, but I missed this part of the discussion. I had another appointment I needed to be at. So I'll go to Jason or Sonny, uh, who led the meeting, uh, to see if they can provide you uh, answers to your questions. Maybe Jason can start. Sure, and I see um, John Whiteside is on the call and he 
um, could probably um, revisit it also. But I think the main point was that they, some of the advisors who were on the call um, thought that the 20,000 pounds would be better um, and that they, you know, would utilize what they can get. Um, so I, I don't think they were opposed to an increase, um, but I think they, um, they thought the, their um, proposal put forth at the, monitor, at the monitoring committee up to uh, a, a doubling to 12,000 pounds would have been better. Okay. Um, John, I see your hand, keep, your hand keeps John Whiteside. I see your hand going up. Um, do you have something that you'd like to offer maybe to help Dewey? Was it now? Maybe it was Dan. Somebody just asked the question. I can't remember who it was. Um, but maybe you can offer your thoughts uh, if you were participating on that call, John. I was. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, I'm a part of the AP as well as the monitoring committee. And at both of those meetings recently, I was um, in favor of a 12,000 uh, pound trip limit, not um, uh, not the 20. I think um, Jason just misspoke there. Um, and there was another member of the monitoring committee who also uh, expressed the 12,000. And then um, at the AP, there was further discussion about, uh, I believe, uh, of a 10,000. Uh, we are at 11% of the uh, of the quota this year. We're less than half of what we were last year. We're you know 3.3 million pounds versus 5.9 last year and uh, year before uh, you know five point right about 5.9 million year before that 6.2. So we're way off of what the uh, the tech is this year. And there's if if we had gone to 10,000 in in July, I think we'd still be behind uh, because of the vessel participation drop um, that has continued over the last few years. So anything we can do to uh, to get to maximize MSY and uh, and achieve that TAL uh, is, uh, you know, is, is where I think we should be headed, having the low trip limit uh is is just going to hinder us so thank you yeah thanks john um i will say that i and maybe jason can can weigh in or correct me if i'm wrong but i think there's a fine line uh between an increase to the, the degree of increase whether or not we can do that increase through specifications or through a framework adjustment and you know in my opinion doubling the trip limit this is just my opinion. I think it would be better to, you know, move forward in it with a framework adjustment, get the public involved more so than they would be during specification setting and, you know, have have other alternatives to consider uh, about, you know, more than just a thousand or a fifteen hundred pound increase to the trip limit, which is what's being considered here and what the committee recommended. So um, I do like the I do like where the committee went, which would be an increase now. Um, with the consideration of a framework adjustment after the next assessment this summer. Um, so we have all the information available to us in providing for um, and making sure that uh, the council's informed and the public's informed based on the, the, the most available, you know, the most um, recent science uh, regarding the stock of, of tiny dogfish. So um, that's just my, those are just my thoughts. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, that's, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay quickly with the public. I have one other hand, and then I'll come back to the council, and we'll start taking up action uh, as we see fit. Greg G. Domenico, you can go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I was waiting for the motion, but since this um, kind of came up and sped along here before I thought it would, I just wanted to make the same brief comments I made during the committee meeting, um, and I am today. Speaking on behalf of Viking Village, which is in Barnegat Light, New Jersey, where we have um, the bulk of our Gimlet fleet that participates in this fishery. 
um, they feel that um, any increase in the trip limit will cause uh, the fishery to change itself uh, in, in this manner. Uh, they feel that more net will go in the water, which is uh, contrary to the situation we are facing um, with protected resources, chiefly right whales and humpback whales. We feel, they also feel strongly that um, more net in the water will create a lower quality dogfish and could increase discards in the directed fishery um, and would ultimately lead to a lower price. So while they completely understand that we're well behind catching the entire quota, uh, they feel strongly that at this point they would uh, prefer to see the staff recommendation maintained um, for all the reasons I just uh, mentioned. And I think um, tomorrow during the protected resources or later on today, I think you will hear from the GARFO staff that this is no longer an issue of vertical lines. This is an issue of the gill nets that are in the water. So we would we'd prefer not to see any more gill nets in the water for that reason. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Greg. Appreciate your thoughts. Um, let's come back to the council at this time. Um, I'm going to go to Joe Semino and then Dan, I'll come back to you. Go ahead, Joe. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I uh, obviously. I, I, I support uh, Greg's comments and, and uh, what I believe staff recommendation for status quo here. Um, I know I'm coming before the motion as well, but I, I'm doing that because. I listened to the committee meeting and I thought there was great discussion there. I, I, I thought, you know, all of this has once again been weighed out very fairly. And with that, I'm going to say that instead of trying to substitute this motion that I'll, you know, I think it's only fair to let it uh, be voted on, although I, I will be voting against it for the reasons Greg laid out and some adjacents as well. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Joe. Uh, Dan Farnham. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I think I'm going to wait and may, uh, wait until the motion is on the table. Then I'll make my okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we we can hold off and and get something to focus our our attention. Um, so, Jason, uh, give me a little advice here on on how we would proceed. So, we do we need to set we need to set the quota, um, but then we have this trip limit issue. So. So no, no action is necessary um, relative to the ABC. We're in multi-year specs. Um, okay. If the council, um, if there's no motion or desire to change the ABC, um, I think the council just can be quiet on that um, and take that as um, you know, no, no desire to change that at this time. Gotcha. Okay. Well, let me ask the council. Um, is there anyone from the council who would like to, or well, is there any objection to moving forward uh, with a status quo on the ABC for next year's fishery? Okay, I see no hands at this time. So we'll assume that um, the council fully supports uh, maintaining um, status quo ABC for next year. No. No desire to change ABC. Perfect. Now we can talk about the trip limit um, and the and the motions that came out of the committee last week. So, Sonny, um, this is your committee. If you can, um, would you like? Can you please read the motion into the record for the council, and then we'll take that we'll take that motion up. Um, and get questions and comments and, and thoughts about it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yep, you sound good. Okay, I move to adopt a trip limit increase to 7,500 pounds via the most expedient process possible, likely via specifications with an expedient NEPA document if possible. Okay, 
So Sonny Gwynn is making that motion on behalf of the committee. That is a motion that does not need a second. So we're considering now uh, increasing the federal trip limit from 6,000 pounds to 7,500 pounds. And I'm gonna turn to the council uh, to see if anybody has any comments. Joe. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I guess to, uh, you gave a great summary of the committee and, and, and also your feelings that anything larger like a doubling would be a framework, but is, can I just get clarification? Is, is that kind of a guarantee that if we were to move beyond this, we would be talking about a framework and, and giving the public a chance to weigh in on this? Yeah, you know, I, that was my opinion because I feel like I don't know where the line's drawn. Maybe there is a line. I'm going to turn to Jason in a second, Joe. But I, I feel like if we drastically change the trip limit, we should involve more. There should be more public involvement, um, a longer process with with multiple options uh, for consideration. But uh, let me go to Jason uh, to see if he if he knows a little more than I do. I'm sure he does about where that line might be and whether or not this is something that we can do under specs or. If we increase to 12,000, would we need to do a framework? Jason? Yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky. It's, 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 it may be a fine line, but it's also a, a, a blurry fine line. Um, you know, in general framework, um, you know, the, you know, in macro squid butterfish, we've certainly done some substantial trip limit changes through the specs process. But I think in that case, there wasn't an expectation that it would kind of change the, the nature of the fishery operation. Um, I think the monitoring committee, I think, has been concerned and provided the input that, you know, there, given the potential concern for, um, you know, for some substantial change in the nature of the fishery, if, it, if the quota was doubled, given you know, there is a lot of activity uh, if the trip limit was doubled, given there is a lot of activity right at the trip limit now, um, that that seems more appropriate for a framework. Um, and you know, I guess I'd ask, you know, Garfo to to kind of confirm um, that, 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 you know, that's um, that this seems to rise to a substantial enough change to warrant a um, uh, a framework versus just dealing in specifications. All right, thanks, Jason. Uh, Mike Penny, I just saw your hand. Go ahead, Mike. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, just to follow up on that, you know, the the regulations clearly say that you know part of the specifications process is to set the possession limit, the federal possession limit. So, arguably. Any possession limit, six thousand pounds, five thousand pounds, twenty thousand um, pounds, could be done through a specifications process rather than a framework. Um, but you know, there's kind of two important questions associated with that. One is um, the level of NEPA analysis that would be required, and I think kind of Jason kind of hit on that. You know, anything significant. A significant deviation from what we've done in the past uh, would require a more uh, thorough <clears throat> and expanded NEPA analysis. So we'd move probably away from, um, you know, what we call a SIR to, uh, you know, a full environmental assessment if we're going to have a significant increase in the possession limit. And then the other aspect of that is really just a there's a policy call on behalf, you know, of the council. Um, you know, and, and Jason kind of hit on this point too. There's, there's, a, and we've heard this during the public comment um, already. There's, there's a wide variety of perspectives on what the possession limit for, um, for dogfish should be, and so kind of a council best practices would, you know, if the council is going to consider substantial changes to the possession limit, going through a framework process, you know, ensures a more comprehensive public review and, and opportunities for public comment. Than the specs process, but that's not a legal call. That's really just a, a council practice uh, decision, I think, because the regulations say you can set the possession limit as part of the specs process. I think if the council was contemplating eliminating the possession, the federal possession limit entirely, um, 
that would I think that would would then violate the, the regulations in, for specs and would, would require at least uh, a framework adjustment, if not an amendment. Okay, I appreciate that, Mike. Gives us something to think about um, in moving forward. I do think, though, that the increase here, um, you know, I'm comfortable with the increase being done via specs. It's not that much of an increase, and uh, I'll just I'll lay it out there for everybody. Uh, I would be uncomfortable if we were doubling or tripling the, the trip limit and doing it just through specs. It would, it would make me uncomfortable, and as chair of the council, I would have to work with staff to determine whether or not we would move forward um, with a framework adjustment in the future if that were something um, that would come out of possibly uh, an action after the stock assessments completed this summer. So uh, I'll stop there and let other council members speak on this. I'm just going to go down the line. Uh, we'll start with Chris Bat Savage. Go ahead, Chris. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I support the motion. Although at the committee meeting, I was uh, I, I had some concerns before ultimately uh, supporting it. Then um, in some of those, uh, you know, were you know, just the, the the timing and process of of you know getting this done through specifications in time for the next mission season uh, was was a little uncertain. Although uh, I think as Jason. Uh, uh, described it, it, it can be done, um, and uh, and also uh, you know potential protective resources concerns uh, with uh, with any with 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 increasing uh, the, the trip limit if that increased effort uh, how that might work in toward towards risk reduction uh, which we'll hear more about later this afternoon. Um, but uh, but you know again it's it's not a it's not a very large increase. Um, you know it it, it could incentivize. Uh, you know, some high, you know, higher landings, what we currently have now, which is really low. Uh, although, yeah, I think some of that is going to be offset by, by things that are that are out of control of, uh, of, of the management process when it comes to dogfish, uh, you know, such as availability kind of the northern and southern parts of the range. You know, some some years they're there, some years they're not. Uh, and then other challenges such as in North Carolina, where uh, last Last year, our landings dropped by about 90% from like you know, 1.4 million pounds down to 130, 140,000 pounds. And that had really a lot to do with uh, the shoaling of Hatteras Inlet, where boats that were heavily engaged in the fishery in the past uh, couldn't even get out of the inlet and go fish after about the second, third week of January. So, I mean, there, there's, you know, with, with dogfish, there's, there, there's a lot of things kind of at play in terms of, uh, you know, what we see in, as far as landings go. But, uh, I think I think increasing the trip limit by fifteen hundred pounds is uh, is a safe bet for now as we uh, you know wait the uh, the updated stock assessment next year. Thanks. All right, thanks, Chris. Appreciate your comments and thoughts, uh, Dan Farnham. You're next. Yep. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. I um I, I I voted for the motion on the committee level, and I'll vote for it today too on the council level. You know, I thought I thought on the committee that with the discussion, all the, the public input, the different committee members, the input, um, people were for and against the trip limit increase. You know, uh, from the monitor committee, there was the, the you know the industry members wanted the doubling of the limit. I really kind of thought this was a good compromise to go with a with a small increase. The last two increases were small, and through I think through the spec package too. I'm not sure on that. Uh, yeah. There's no price effect from either one of those increases. I thought going with a small increase now through the spec package would be appropriate, and it would also give us a chance to analyze that going forward. And then, like you stated before, and Jason said, we also had had a motion to to recommend uh, uh, going forward with a framework to both council with both councils to 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 look at different trip limits, be them be it higher or lower in the future, depending upon how the uh, the track assessment came back, so I, I would vote for this motion. I would and I would also vote for the uh, for the, the following motion too. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Dan. Uh, Dewey, you're next. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Uh, I uh, uh, support this motion and, and will be voting for it. Um, I don't feel like that 1500 pounds is going to have any um, 
15 extra 100 pounds is going to have anything that's going to hurt the quality of the fish. I believe fishermen can know how to take care of the fish. Um, and also the states, it's in the, if they don't want to implement, they can decide on their own trip limit that's less, uh, more restrictive. So they have that ability already. And, and, and so I, I think that uh, a little bit of extra fish uh, would help fishermen up and down the coast, whether some fishermen choose to harvest that amount, they don't have to harvest uh, 7,500 pounds if that is what becomes a trip limit. But also think that the aging of the fleet and a low value dogfish and a lot of incurred expenses uh, is having a multiple effect here. So, um, you know, I, I just think there's a lot of, lot of different things that play up and down the coast uh, in, in different areas and, and the limited processing and the markets that are available to the processor. Uh, but I support the fifth, uh, a 7,500 pound, uh, trip limit, uh, whenever that can be done expediently as possible. Thank you. All right. Thanks Dewey for your comments. Adam Nowalski, you're next. Thanks. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, I was kind of coming into this little blind as not having been contacted uh, by our community ahead of time. Uh, I do hear the comments from Mr. DiDomenico about one portion of our industry. Uh, that being said, I am faced with a unanimous committee decision. I'm faced with a fishery that appears to be underutilized. Uh, I certainly know from the recreational side, there's many people that would welcome uh you know that fishery being utilized uh so i'm having a hard time uh opposing this motion uh one question i do have though related to it is the way the motion reads via the most expedient process possible what does that exactly tie us to as a council if it's determined that the most expedient, uh, we've heard comments that suggest specifications will likely be the way this is done, but if there should be some hiccup in that process and the most expedient process becomes a framework or an amendment, does this motion as it's written tie us to that have that essentially been initiated as a result of this motion because that alternative means the specs becomes the most expedient process or is this motion saying that if it's not specs that it wouldn't happen i would say adam um, my interpretation of this is simply the most expedient process possible period in parentheses is providing a likelihood of specifications being the most expedient um which i which i think if you ask anyone we that that is the most that is the quickest way to get something done rather than having a framework adjustment or an amendment so that's just providing an example of what would be would likely be the most expedient process possible i don't think it ties us to anything but I would assume that um, that specifications is going to be the quickest route for us to get to an increased trip limit. Um, but if it ends up not being the quickest, then we'd have to consider other alternatives. Maybe Jason can add to that as well. Jason? Yeah, I do think, um, you know, given the discussions and unless, um, you know, the Gar Garfo has had a, a change of thought process on the applicability of an emergency action that taking um, that likely, you know, out at this point um, may 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 make sense. So that it's 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 not ambiguous that we would just be, um, you know, move moving the process via specifications, and and then again we try to expedite the NEPA process. Um, to, to, to the extent possible. So I don't know exactly the, the, the Robert's rules process for a committee motion, but I'm suggesting the council consider just deleting that likely. Okay, let's, let's leave that highlighted for now. Let me get some other thoughts 
Um, I still have Eric Reed and Mike Pitney. Uh, based on the discussion, I'm going to go to Mike next. Eric, I'll follow, you can follow Mike um, on that. So, Mike, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I was going to make two points, um, one of which was uh, kind of builds on the last comment about what we mean by the motion saying via the most expedient process possible. I think generally, um, you know, we do choose the most expedient process possible. We don't tend to decide unilaterally, oh, we, let's do it. Let's do an EIS just for kicks for this action. Um, you know, if we can do a SIR, we're going to do a SIR. If we can do specs, we're going to do specs. And I think I've indicated that we can do specs because the regulations clearly state that specs are a component of, or trip limits are a component of specs. So I would suggest if we're going to delete anything to clean up this motion to be more clear, we just delete everything after pounds. Um, I mean, that's what we're doing is we're, we're, the council would be adopting or recommending um, that we increase the trip limit to 7,500 pounds as part of the specs process. Um, everything else seems uh, unnecessary. Uh, and the second point I wanted to make is <clears throat> that I will vote in favor of this motion because I think it's a reasonable compromise given a, a lot of the public comment that we've heard today. I know it's not unanimous, but um, we have heard uh, a variety of, of, of people's uh, positions on this. And I think a, a, a marginal 15, you know, 25% increase in the, in the quota or the possession limit is, is a reasonable way to go. But I also wanted to clarify that, um, you know, we, we need to hear from the New England Council um, in a couple months. And they may take a different approach, uh, and it's possible that I would support a different motion at that meeting. Um, and then ultimately, if we do get two different uh, recommendations, as Jason indicated earlier, uh, then the agency would need to select um, effectively between the two recommendations of the council. And so I wanted people to be clear, if I support this motion today, uh, that doesn't, that shouldn't be an indication of how I would uh, what decision I might make if we get a different recommendation from the New England Council. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Mike, for that clarification and your suggestion about cleaning up this motion. Um, I'm going to have to ask John Almeida for some advice. Uh, we've this is a committee motion. Uh, it's now um, in possession by the council, and I don't should. Is this something where if John, if the council does not oppose the removal of the highlighted section that's on our screen right now, is that simple enough to remove it? Should I, or, or are we too far along? Do we need to do a, a substitute or an amendment to strike, to strike those words from this, from this motion? I mean, where it, where it is coming as a committee motion, I think that. We might want to go through the formality of amending it to remove that highlighted language if that's what the council yeah. wishes to do. I mean, I, yeah. I, okay. I, presume, I presume you would try to do it by consent by consent. Um, and if that's the case, you know, just go through that formality. Yeah, let's I, I think that I, I, I would prefer going through the formality. So, um. Mike made a good point, uh, as others did, about you know clarifying this and um, using the most ex um, expedited process and expedient process uh, possible. So, let me turn to, and Eric, I'll get I'll get to you in just a second. Um, let me turn to the council to see if anyone would like to make a motion to amend to strike the highlighted section from the main motion. Adam, I see your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that's a great way forward addresses my concern. So I will make that motion. I move to amend to strike uh, all words after pounds. Okay, thank you for that. We have a motion by Adam Nowalski. Dewey Hemmelright, are you seconding that? Yes, sir. Okay, we have a second by Dewey. Eric Reed, I'm going to come to you next, and then uh, I know you wanted to probably comment on the trip limit, uh, so, but you can make comment whatever you'd like to do, either on the amended motion or the trip limit at this point. Eric, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, Mr. Pentney basically covered the, the 
the process portion of this. New England is going to have to take up some sort of action, a following action, I believe. Um, to the motion amended or not, you know, I, I certainly support an increase, the increased flexibility, a, a trip limit, a modest trip limit increase is going to provide to the fleet. Uh, this is a market driven fishery and taking a, advantages of, of economies of scale is not the worst thing in the world. So I, I would support the motion itself, however it, it turns out. But uh, I was more concerned about the process going forward in the jointly managed plan. Gotcha. Okay, Eric, thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, so we have a motion to amend. Um, is there any comment from the council on this motion to amend? Is there any comment from the public? On this motion to amend. Okay, seeing no hands, bring it back to the council. Is there any objection to the motion to amend by members of the council? Okay, seeing no objection, the motion carries by consent. We'll we go ahead and strike the words after pounds. From the main motion. Okay. Okay, back to the discussion on 7,500 pounds. Are there any further comments by members of the council on this? Okay, seeing no hands at this time and not having heard from from everyone around the table. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read the motion call the question. So be prepared to put your hands up uh, for this and we'll go ahead and get a count. This is for council members um, only. I move to adopt a trip limit increase to 7500 pounds. All those in favor of this motion, please raise your hand. Okay, I counted 18. Did anyone else get a similar count? I got 18 as well. Okay. Okay, that's 18 in favor. You can take your hands down, please. All those, everybody's hand down, yes. All those opposed to the motion, please raise your hand. Okay, that's two. Take your hands down. Any abstentions? With a count of 20, we should not have any abstentions, so zero abstentions. Motion carries 18 to 2 to 0. I'll wait to get that notation on the screen. And then we had one more motion from the committee. Sonny, can I ask you to read that on behalf of the committee to the council? Yes, Mr. Yes. Chair. I get I got a bad echo. I move that council prioritize a framework to consider additional trip limit changes with work beginning after the completion of the research track assessment. Okay, thanks, Sonny. Um, so we have a motion on behalf of the committee 
It does not require a second. And I will look to members of the council first for any comments that they'd like to make on behalf of this motion. Peter Hughes. Hey, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I have a question. Where, and I know it was only yesterday, and I'm trying to look it up now, the presentation, but where was, uh, where does this stand on the committees or on the council's prioritization list that we reviewed yesterday morning? I just, I, I mean, if this is already on the list, do we have to make this motion? Or is well, it not on the list and we need to add it to the priorities list? Well, so I don't, maybe Chris can help me too a little bit with this, but I, I looked up the same thing you did uh, or trying to look up. So under 22 proposed actions and deliverables from yesterday's executive committee meeting, uh, under spiny dogfish, there is uh, a number 30. The number 30 says develop 2023 through 2023 specifications. Um, so we will need to put forth specifications. Now this, this is talking about the, um, prioritizing a framework, which is different from, from that. So it's not specifically listed, uh, here in the part in the actions and deliverables for 2022. Um, and it's not one of the issues in possible actions at this time. So, this would be something that if this motion passes, uh, we would have to have a discussion as a council about where this falls and what might need to be given up in order to do this work. Um, but maybe Chris, I don't, I don't, is Chris Moore here with us this morning? I'm sure he is. Um, of course I am. Of course I am, Mr. Chairman. Where else yeah, I, I didn't see your name earlier, but yeah. What do you think about, was I, Am I leading people astray or am I kind of on the right track about what we'd have to do here with this motion if, if it were to pass? Well, the, the, you, you said it, you said it right. Um, we, the key is that yesterday we had a meeting with the executive committee, not the council, right? So the executive right. committees develop recommendations on 2022 uh, implementation, a 2022 implementation plan for consideration by the council in December. And obviously we haven't gotten to the council yet. So um, this would, be done exactly the way that you just mentioned it. This would be something that we'd carry forward to our meeting in December and then decide how to uh, integrate it into that 2022 plan. Okay. But this, so if this motion were to pass, because it says prioritize, it doesn't necessarily bind us to having to put it into the plan, but put it into, this could, we'd have to prioritize this among other things. And it could fall to possible, possible additions. It could fall in with the under spiny dogfish. That that would be the prioritization piece, right? Exactly. So you know, okay. we expect, yeah. So we expect there's other things that might happen between now and December, right? Right. And in fact, yesterday I mentioned that we were going to be having the spiny dogfish uh, discussion today. And there might be some changes to what we had on the page in front of folks yesterday as a result of the meeting today. So this would be. This would be a good example of that. Yeah, so we'll bundle, yeah, so we'll bundle it all up for council consideration in December and then decide how to deal with it then. Excellent. Okay. Jason, did you want to add? Um, one thought in terms of, you know, kind of clarity for the public as people review motions coming out of the meeting, um, if potentially the council could amend this to say you know, i move that in december the council consider prioritizing than the rest then it would be clear that you know it's it's an issue of concern uh, no final decision has been made um, but that it's really kind of in december when the council setting 2022 priorities would really be the final decision whether to, to start something or not um, Okay. May not be necessary, just a thought. Yeah. Um, I do like that for transparency, transparency's sake. Um, but that does, well, 
it's going to be on our we're going to we're going to announce that that discussion on you know we we plan for it in december to finalize our our um, implementation plan so i don't know that we need to jump through the hoops to put that detail into this motion especially since it came from committee it's not like we're I mean, I'm I'm comfortable with it with it the way it is. I, I, let me ask others and see what they think. Um, Peter, I hope we answered your question okay. We're 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 answering it. Yes, thank you. Okay, Adam Nowalski. I would first say that I think I tend to prefer uh, Jason's suggested modification here, uh, that what we would do today would be to uh, put this before the discussion in December regarding council priorities. Uh, depending on the timeline for the research track assessment, uh, this might not actually be in action until 2023, so it might not even need to be a 2022 action. Uh, which leads me to my next point is that, you know, given the discussion today, uh, we did go ahead and move the trip limit. There were some concerns that were put on the record about that. Uh, I suspect the intention of this framework would be to consider, uh, while this says additional trip limit changes, so I think there would be discussion about bumping the trip limit back down potentially. Uh, I think the discussion is pretty clear that the nature of this framework would be to consider additional increases. Uh, so I am wondering if this might be premature. Uh, and I would look for some guidance here as to if there is other sentiment about this motion being premature, uh, would a direction be that this motion would be better to be defeated here or would leadership uh, recommend a motion to um, postpone this until after the research track assessment. And I think that's where my level of comfortability lies right now, uh, is that the idea of a trip limit change consideration through framework sounds like a good idea, but I think it's really going to depend on what we learn out of that research track assessment. I think we're going to need to have that in front of us. Uh, I think there was a clear support around the table for the increase, but at an incremental level that we discussed today. So maybe this might be a little premature here. I think the committee did a good job of bringing before us, um, but I think I would lean towards actually, towards not taking action on whether we need to initiate that framework until after I see that assessment. I'm wondering if your thoughts are whether that's best to be through motion to postpone or to vote this down. Well, so, so Adam, I, I look at it a little differently. Um, in this case here with this motion, we are not initiating any framework in any way. We are just, con we are prioritizing the possible framework after the research track assessment. So, you know, we could put this in possible additions to 2022. It could be, it could hold off. We could hold off on any type of initiation of a framework action until 2023. Um, you know, we, nothing, nothing will happen until we get the information from uh, the, re, the, the research track assessment um, later, the, later next year. And so I see it as, you know, making an announcement to the public through our implementation plan that this is something that the council is considering. And in December, um, we'll have to decide how important it is to put it on our 20, either put it on our 2022 implementation plan as something we, we intend to complete or as something that we may take on if time allows. And, and, you know, depending on the, depending on how that, that assessment comes out, we may ultimately decide not to do the framework. Uh, there is no initiation here, which is, I think, good wording as far as prioritize rather than initiate. So, I mean, I'm comf I'm comfortable. Not, I don't, I don't think there's a reason to postpone this. Uh, you certainly don't need to vote in favor of it, but I think by, by, moving this forward, we're telling the public that this is something that the council is going to consider in its priority settings. So, I'm, I'm comfortable with the way it is right now. Um, and I don't, I'm not necessarily sure that we need to add the extra words, but if somebody wants to add in December, 
uh, move that in December 2021. The count. I'm, I'm I'm happy if somebody wants to make that amendment. Um, we'll certainly we'll certainly discuss it. But I'm I'm comfortable with the way it is now. But you know, you guys, I'll look to you to see if anybody wants to make that change. Kate Wilkie, I've got your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess the the word prioritize um, gives me a bit of confuses me a little bit here, um, and I just want to clarify that. In voting for this motion, it just means that we would then talk about it during the discussion of the council's implementation plan. Is that That's right? Correct. Okay, That's so it's correct. not necessarily saying that that voting yes for this means that it's on the list as as a definite action we're going to pursue. Right, because if you remember from yesterday, in the discussions that we had, we there's a draft implementation plan already put forth and making adjustments to that implementation plan and moving things up into the species category requires there to be some give and take and there may not be anything to give and take at this point. And so we that that's where the priority setting comes in. Do we feel that this is more important than other things on the list? Um, and so if we feel it's important, but it doesn't need to rise to the level of being something that we intend to complete, then we can put it in as possible, possible, uh, what's it called? possible additions section and see where that leads, you know, through the year. So there's a number of different ways that this type of concept can be put into the, to the plan, or, you know, even if this motion were to pass the council can discuss this as far as implementation goes for 2022 and decide not to add it. Um, they could say it's a low priority. We already have a lot on our plate and let's postpone this uh, and we'll reconsider it for the 2023 implementation plan. You know, that's all, all of that is, is those are all different options that can happen as a result of, of supporting this. I hope that helps with your question. Yeah, thanks Mike. Jason, did you have something you wanted to add? No. Okay. Adam? So, based on that discussion, I, I think my preference would be to make this crystal clear to everyone around the table and, and the public with this motion. Uh, taking Jason's comments early, I'm going to move to substitute that the council consider the addition of a framework I'm just waiting for everybody to catch up here. That the council consider the addition of a framework to consider additional spiny dogfish trip limit changes to the 2022 implementation plan in December. Okay, thanks, Adam. Let's let Jason clean that up for a second here, and then we'll I'll call for a second. Okay, that's very clear in my opinion. Um, it sets the stage for the December meeting. It also um, sets the stage for the consideration of an, adding a framework to the work plan for 2022. So uh, we have a motion on the board right now made by Adam Nawalski. Is there a second to that motion? Would anyone like to second that motion? Uh, Peter Hughes is going to second. Adam, you've, you've spoken to your thoughts. I'll, I'll give you one another opportunity if you'd like to provide more rationale, if you feel it's it's necessary. I do not feel it's necessary, but thank you for the opportunity. Okay. Peter Hughes, did you wanna add any thoughts on rationale why you'd support uh, the motion? I, I don't, I just didn't realize that my question was gonna spark this much um deliberations <laughs> thanks no it's, it's it's all good you're it's it's okay this is why we're here um 
We want to make sure things are right. We want to make sure things are clear, especially to the public and and to you know members of the council who um, we want to make sure everybody's got got their uh, head screwed on right and understands exactly what's happening here. So that's that's we take all the time we need. Dan Farnham. I, yep, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to support the substitute here. Uh, you know, at a committee level, I think it was pretty clear that that the thought was to consider trip limit changes after the track assessment was completed and analyzed and ready for management consideration, you know. And honestly, I, I didn't even think we would even get that far in 2022. 22 is right around the corner. In my mind, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I kind of thought this framework, once it got through both council's considerations, wouldn't even be started until 2023. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. So let me ask you, Adam, um, was it your intent not to include the uh, research track assessment as a as a trigger point for this framework to be considered in this motion? I think we would have that discussion in December. Uh, I would hope that this discussion would provide staff with the ability to bring to us uh, clear updates uh, in December as to what that timeline is going to look like, what we can specifically expect, and I think we can have that discussion then. Uh, I think if the discussion is that the track assessment is not going to be uh, accepted for management use through both councils by the end of 2022, then I think it would make it very clear uh, the council could put this concept of adding this somewhere in the hopper. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Moore would do a great job of bringing it up uh, next uh, October uh, when we talk about council priorities for 2023 as a possible addition at that point. Uh, if we're thinking that this might wind up uh, on the plan with some work started in 2022 because of the timeline for the research track assessment, uh, then I think this would be a great candidate to the possible additions list in December. Wouldn't require that we move anything else off at that time, uh, but at least we'd have a placeholder for it. Uh, and if we were confident that we would be ready to potentially act on this as a result of the completion of the assessment in 2022, then that would put us in a position to have an informed discussion about what else we might want to uh, bump off a list to prioritize this when we discuss that implementation plan. So uh, I think uh, Mr. Farnham's comments are, are, are spot on. Uh, and I think that we can have that discussion about where this specifically fits at the December meeting with a little more information. Okay. All right. Thanks, Adam. Uh, anyone else from the council have anything they want to offer to the motion to substitute? Mike Penny. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to note that, you know, for a framework adjustment to move forward, it would require adoption by both councils. Um, I don't believe the New England Council has uh, a framework such as this uh, on their potential prioritization list for 2022. Uh, maybe uh, Chairman Reed could speak to that, but I believe that for this to move forward, as a joint framework next year would have to be on the priority lists for both councils. Uh, I'm not saying that this motion should be defeated because of that, but it, it may um, suggest maybe a letter to the New England Council or something if this motion passes, just to be aware. Okay. Okay, thanks, Mike. Eric Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this point, uh, I do not believe that New England has it on their list for 2022. Okay. I appreciate that. Okay. Anyone else from uh, the council? Comments or questions? Okay, seeing none at this time. Anyone from the public? Have any comments, questions about the motion to substitute? 
before I call the question. Okay, seeing none at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and read the motion into the record, and then I'm gonna call the question of the council. I move that the council consider the addition of a framework to consider additional spiny dogfish trip limit changes to the 2022 implementation plan in December. Motion by Adam Nowalski, seconded by Peter Hughes. All those in favor of the motion, please indicate by raising your hand. I have 14. Did anyone else get the same count? I have 14 as well. Okay, great. That's 14 in favor. If you can please take your hands down. Okay, thank you. All those opposed, same sign. I'm counting four. Four in opposition. Please take your hands down. Thank you. Any abstentions? Okay, I have one abstention. Okay, so with a call of 14 to four to one, motion carries now becomes the main motion. Is it just a property of the council now or should it have the maker and seconder? It's the property of the council at this point. Okay, I'm not going to read it back into the record, uh, but I will ask one last time. Are there any comments or on behalf of the council on this motion that was just supported? Okay, uh, all those in favor of the now, the now the main motion, um, please indicate by raising your hand. Counted, I think I got 18 there. Did you count 18? Yep, I have 18 as well. Okay, so that's 18 in favor. Mr. Chair, can you tell me is my hand raised? This is Peter Hughes. It has a lot, it, it has a slash through it. I can't tell. Your hand was up. Okay, thank you. Yep, okay. That's 18 in favor. If you guys can all put your hands down. <laughs> Maureen and Ellen, your hand. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, all those opposed? Okay, seeing no hands, that's zero in opposition. And I'm assuming there'll be one abstention. Any abstentions? We do have one abstention. Okay, motion carries 18 to zero to one. Jason, is there anything else that we need to take on under spiny dogfish specifications review today? No, and staff, um, 
sound like uh, I can just confirm that you'd like to just communicate to, I mean, I already communicated to staff in New England, kind of what the council might be considering, but we can do that a little more um, formally um, just to, so folks up there know um, and yeah. there's any objection. Yeah, I think in the past, haven't we sent them the motions that have carried? We just let them know kind of where we stand. Yeah, I think um, I already talked to them about um, um, likely presenting for them at their December meeting just for specifications. Um, but yeah, we, we, we can do some additional communication. Okay, excellent. All right, well, that concludes our business today under Spiny Dogfish Specifications Review. Uh, let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break and we'll come back and take up private tilefish reporting. Thank you everyone for your participation this morning uh, on dogfish and uh, we'll come on back at about uh, just a little, a couple minutes after 11. Thank you.
This is Doug Potts. Before we come back, I just want to make sure I'm sounding okay. Is that okay? Yep, you're good, Doug. Hey, Doug Potts, this is Matt Seeley, Council Staff. Just curious, are you or John going to share your screen for the presentation? I think John is. Yeah, I can share my screen. Okay, John, you're all set. Good to go with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Hey, Matt, this is Jason. Um, sorry to jump in. I just wanted to flag um, uh, folks sent me spine dogfish triplets. Maryland and Delaware are 10,000 pounds. Uh, for their state limits, I may have said 12,000 for Maryland. Just wanted to uh, clarify that. So thanks. Bye. <clears throat> okay, welcome back everyone. We had a nice little break. Uh, we have one more item on our agenda here this morning. Um, we're going to talk about the private tilefish reporting and we have Matt Seely with us on this as well as Doug Potts. Doug, are you are you ready to go on this one? Uh, I think so, but I, I think John is going to take uh, the lead on at least most of the talk. Oh, okay. And I'll, I'll sum up at the end, but thank you. Yes. Yeah, no, it just, uh, I just popped up on my screen. So John Sullivan's here with us as well. Uh, welcome, John. Welcome, Doug. And uh, whenever you guys are ready to get started, uh, you may begin. All right, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Can you guys all see my screen? Do I have that up there? Your desktop, you just yeah, slide your desktop. Oh. We, the presentation was on. It popped yeah. up for like a quick I was trying to unmute there myself and I minimized it. All right, does that work? There it is. You're Perfect. good. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is John Sullivan. I'm with the Analysis and Program Support Division of the GARFO, and we're going to give you a, a brief overview of the Recreational Tilefish Permit Program. Uh, so, the GARFO started issuing recreational tilefish permits in August of 2020. Uh, to date, we have issued 814 unique vessels recreational tilefish permits. 68 of those vessels are, also hold uh, another permit issued by GARFO, uh, as well as the recreational tilefish permit, uh, which means that's about 750 of those vessels only hold rec tilefish permits from GARFO. Uh, and to date, a total of 42 EVTRs have been submitted by 25 vessels for recreational trips, landing, or discarding tilefish. Uh, this slide is just a breakdown of the number of permits issued. Uh, for recreational tilefish by state, uh, as well as the number of uh, permit holders with other permits in addition to the recreational recreational tilefish permit, uh, broken down also by the number who hold who hold party charter permits, some sort of commercial or international permits, uh, and multi species permits. Uh, and from what we see here, uh, there's not really a trend that. The states that have the most recreational tilefish permits also have the most vessels with additional permits. Uh, but there's not really, uh, I mean, most most the states with the most tilefish permits have the most others, but most vessels that hold a recreational tilefish permit uh, only hold a recreational tilefish permit. The next slide is just kind of a zoom in on the states that have the most of these permits. Uh, you can see it's they're really kind of concentrated in the Mid Atlantic from New York down to Virginia. Uh, this is just a list of the other permits that some of these vessels that have recreational topfish permits also hold. Uh, so there's everything from bluefish, black sea bass, dogfish, flounder, monkfish, multi-species, red crab, scup, skate, squid, mackerel, and other types of topfish permits. Uh, here we have the number of vessels submitting VTRs and VTRs submitted. The first column here is uh, total VTRs submitted uh, by any vessel that holds a recreational tilefish permit. The first number is the, the total number of these vessels. The number in parentheses is the number uh, from vessels that only hold a recreational tilefish permit. So 43 vessels submitted a VTR, 26 of those vessels only hold recreational tilefish permits. Uh, the next column, these are the number of vessels submitting and VTR submitted for uh, recreational trips and recreational trips that land or discard a tilefish according to the VTRs, the last column. Next up, we have the, the number of permits and VTRs and uh, a landing summary for states which had enough permits to, to present without violating confidentiality. Uh, we can see that Maryland, New Jersey, and Virginia, again, that's that mid-Atlantic region where most of the permits and the VTRs are coming from. Uh, we've got a total of 560 pounds landed that since we started this program in August of 2020. I think I'll pass it on to Doug now to finish up. Thanks. Yeah, so in addition to the, the stats of what we've issued on, on permits, I'm just gonna touch a little bit on, uh, on more of our, our outreach and public feedback side of this. Um, as you, you know, this was launched in, in mid-2020, uh, and most of our outreach efforts have been focused on that 2020 launch. Um, we, this was an entirely new constituency for us to deal with, the private recreational vessels, and so it had a, a lot of focus on, on getting the word out early on. Um, as John mentioned, we've had over 800 of these permits, uh, vessels issued these permits, and that was a higher number than we expected uh, going out, so I think we've had a pretty good job of, of reaching out to those those individuals um, in, in our outreach. However, as, as you also mentioned, it's a relatively, it's seemingly low number of VTRs have been submitted. Uh, there are multiple reasons why we may, we've gotten the number of, of VTRs we have. It may be low activity in fishing. Uh, it may be low compliance, either intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, people don't know that they need to, or don't understand that they need to report or some more likely some combination of the, of the two. Some, some level of that is, is why we've, we've seen the number of VTRs we have by this point. Um, one interesting point of, of this permit, because we they apply through Fish Online, it's an entirely electronic application, 
uh, we have a table of a list of uh, viable email addresses for everybody who, is, who gets the permit. Um, we have not currently used that for outreach, but that is available to us to make more targeted reminders uh, to reach out to these permit holders uh, and maybe remind them about reporting requirements or help them out if, if they need to do that uh, a little bit more. Uh, the next slide, please. And then at this point, we've gotten some limited public feedback, but I wanted to share that with you um, primarily through our port agents. There are great eyes and ears out in the field. Um, they've been able to help several people, you know, get fish online accounts when there's been some issues and apply for the permit. Um, board agents tell us that the people they've been working with uh, have no strong preference so far for the reporting app that they're using. Um, primarily from what board agents are seeing, people are using the eTrips mobile or the fish online app and that users tend to stick with whatever app they use first. Um, I'm not sure if, if some of this eTrips mobile use or official line app may have to do with having other permits as well. Um, people that I've talked to, I've only talked to a few people on, on the, the phone working through this. I've actually directed towards that the eFin app to use. I haven't heard much back, but I understand that was probably relatively easy for those who only have the tilefish permit and don't have other reporting requirements to us. Uh, but all of those apps are available and they all seem to be working uh, relatively well. Then that I think concludes it. So I think next slide we go to uh, happy to open up for questions and, and work through what we what we've learned so far. It is still a pretty early in our process. We've been just over a year in in in, uh, in place, and we're still working out uh, reaching out to these this particular constituency that we don't normally work with. Okay, thanks guys for your uh, for the presentation, John and. And Doug, does anyone from the council have any questions uh, that they'd like to ask? Wes Townsend? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, what date does this go through? I mean, is it like from starting in August of last year to the end of August this year? What dates are we talking about? Uh, so these numbers are from the beginning of August of 2020 up until uh, I updated them all yesterday. So this is the most updated we've got it as of the, as of this week. All right, thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, Chris Pat Savage, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, John, you uh, in the presentation uh, you had you showed that uh, some permits were held by. Uh, fishermen from from other states outside of the management unit, such as North Carolina and Florida. Um, and then you also showed uh, kind of a breakdown of you know, where the reported VTRs came from by state. And then you had an other category to uh, cover maybe some confidentiality issues. Um, are you in the for the other category? Um, are you able to say uh, due to confidentiality reasons? If any of those reported trips came from outside of the management unit, you know, from North Carolina South, I'm just wondering if there might be some confusion, um, you know, from some fishermen in the South Atlantic region thinking that they need this permit and they're reporting um, when 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 they don't. Thanks. Uh, thanks. It's a it's a great question. I don't know off the top of my head if any of these trips are from outside the management unit, and uh, nor would I be able to reveal that publicly if I if I did know it. But it, that's a great suggestion about reaching out to maybe somebody from outside of the management unit if if that's the case with these other permits. All right, thanks for that. Um, do we have a right? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and and thanks for the presentation. Um, just like any new implementation of a reporting, uh, I can see by it, we're a long way from having any uh, real success here. Since the last council meeting, probably uh, two council meetings ago, I started looking on social media and on various websites. And in the state of Maryland in July of 2021, from numerous sites, I counted 749 blue line tilefish, both by picture 
and by a personal's own account of their catch. And there was numerous other states, the same, the same thing. And so we're going to have to do some more compliance assistance and outreach on the docs or by social media through folks' email addresses to get compliance up with this. And it's going to probably take some time. But the numbers that's out in reality and what we've seen here today, we got a long way to go. And, and um, I'll stop there at that. All right, thanks, Dewey. Dan Farnham, you're up. Uh, yep, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I I just, I'll say this. I hope the compliance level on the commercial sector is a little bit better than this come November 10th of this year. Um, is there any, any way to cross check the compliance level uh, on, this pro, on this program with, the, with recent MRIP? activity or numbers at this point or is it too early um I, it, it would be really hard to, to cross check this i i did pull uh the most recent mrip numbers um yesterday to see what it has and it you know they do they would show you know a sizable number more fish than this um but those also have pses that are in the 70s and 80s and and are you know relatively unreliable numbers so it's it's hard to judge I don't doubt this is probably a low estimate. It's hard to say how low it is. Um, interestingly, at least, you know, a good thing maybe is that the MRIP numbers show landings primarily in Maryland and Virginia, and our reports primarily come from Maryland and Virginia. So at least there's some consistency in, in where that activity is happening. Um, but again, this, the scale could be an issue, and MRIP numbers have those, those high PSEs, unfortunately. Yep, a quick follow up, Mr. Chairman, please. Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Dan. Yep, yep. Thank you very much. Um, just another observation that you know, I don't see any any trips coming into New York here. Um, and obviously, we we know. I mean, personally, I know people that have gone out and caught tilefish recreationally. So I guess it comes down to 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 compliance, you know, and how we're gonna, how, you know, what we're gonna have to do going forward to increase that compliance level. Um, very good. Thanks for the report, though. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, thanks, Dan. Uh, Kate Wilkie. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for the presentation. This is a really important program uh, attempting to get a better handle on private vessel reporting, especially in light of all the discussion and ongoing council action and staff effort that's being put into changes to recreational management for other species. So um, I, I was curious, um, if, if there is a plan to, is there, is there any penalty for not reporting and is there any encouragement that, that the program offers once the, the license holders have to renew their license? Is that an, do they renew their permits on an annual basis? And if so, is there any box that they check that says, yes, I reported last year or I did not fish last year? Just thinking of, of of ways to encourage better compliance. Uh, the permit is renewed each year. It is it's an annual per, uh, permit like all of our others. Um, there is not a you know a check at the time of of renewal um, asking about missed reports or others because we don't have a, a way of, of verifying whether or not a report is missed or not. Um, although I would not, I don't think we would look for. Did not fish reports that kind of thing. Those those have other issues and problems with them. Um, but I think you're right. There is there is the opportunity for additional outreach and try to raise education on on making sure people who report, I mean, who need to should report, do report. Yeah, I just I think it would go a long way. And when they renew the permit, to if there was some indication on that that renewal that this is an important part of the program and, and, and they should be reporting. Thank you. Yes, uh, yeah, I agree. And, and that you, you did also mention enforcement and I wanted to, to mention on that. There isn't a specific enforcement you know, um, penalty associated with this one that's different than other fisheries. So it would be, it would fall under the general category of, of you know, non-reporting that um, 
for, for enforcement issues. And, and if there is, if, if anyone knows of non-compliance, uh, you know, there are mechanisms to uh, report or to, to make, to, to notify OLE or others to, if, if they believe there is non-compliance that could then lead to, you know, outreach education and or enforcement if, if that's warranted, but those are the same mechanism we have for all other permits. All right, thanks for the question. Uh, thanks for the comment. Scott Lennox, I have you up next. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And guys, thanks for a, a great presentation there. Quick question. Um, we have intercept surveys here in Maryland where they intercept for sea bass and flounder and that sort of thing. Are, are, any, are there any intercept surveys that come across either blue line or golden tile fish um, that aren't counted in these EVTR numbers? Uh, probably. I'm, I'm not, I'm not familiar with the, I think the intercepts are probably part of the MRIP, uh, survey or go into that data. I don't think we, we pull them into this. John, did you have anything additional to say? No, I think th this is just from what's reported through the EVTRs. If there's additional surveys or intercepts and they wouldn't be included in this, but I'm not sure if there are, if those programs or those, if those intercepts exist for tilefish. A quick follow up, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, I just I'm curious on that, guys. Thank you because uh, Dewey's right. I agree with Dewey 100%. And my site might be one of the sites that he's actually referring to. Um, I, I report on recreational and um, charter fishing in Ocean City, and every July when tuna fishing slows down is when the blue line and golden tile fishing picks up. These guys are basically saving their days because the tuna fishing gets pretty slow when that water warms up. And in order to make the charter happier to catch something for their recreational trip, they go deep drop and that's when they catch these tile fish. And I'm certain that some of it is just they, that the fact that they don't know that sometimes they even have to have the permit, much less report on it. Um, so I'm putting them in my report pretty much daily basis throughout July. And I think outreach to them would be really beneficial. Um, and I was just gonna, I was just checking on the intercept thing because these numbers are really, really low. Um, but I personally would trust an extrapolation on these numbers and any EVTRs we have submitted than I would over any MRIP extrapolation. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Scott. And to your to your point about the intercepts, you know, that's part of our APIS program, which is one piece of the of the of the MRIP estimation procedure. And so the intercepts aren't designed to select for certain species, they're designed to capture a snapshot of what's happening on a given day at a given time at a given place. Um, the tile fish are what we consider rare encounters during that survey. They see a lot more stripers and a lot more flounder and sea bass and tog and other things, but um, which is why the estimates that come out of MRIP on, on blue line and golden tile fish uh, can often be quite skewed just because they're ra they're rarely encountered by our intercept team. So, um, just just to give you a little background on on how that works, and that's not just in Maryland. That's up and down the East Coast. Um, you know, each state has the APIS program that they operate. Uh, you know, throughout the through the state. So, we can talk about it later sometime if you have additional questions about about that program. You know, just give me a shout, and I'll be happy to talk to you about it. <clears throat> Appreciate that, Mike. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Scott. All right, Dewey, I have your hand up again. I just want to make one clarification uh, on the number I gave for Maryland. Uh, that was uh, in amount of fish. It wasn't in pounds. And, and what I see here on the landing site, I guess, has been transform transformed into pounds. But but I would agree with Scott uh, that, that we, we need more compliance assistance and educational outreach for folks to know because the fish are getting caught, but it, it doesn't seem like in one year's time that there's been enough outreach or compliance assistance to help these numbers. I, I would have thought it would have be a little bit, uh, well, a lot better, but, but still a ways to go. Thank you. All right, thanks, Dewey. Matt Seely, put your hand up. Do you have something you want to offer? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just wanted to chime in here. Um, 
So I think, you know, Dewey and Scott have kind of hit the nail on the head here with this initiative and what's kind of needed in certain aspects. One thing that I did want to note, though, um, obviously still compliance issues and things going on here. Uh, but for example, the Blue Line Tilefish recreational season runs through May 1st through October 31st. So since this went live in August of 2020, um, and it's still not even the close of the season this year, we still haven't gone through a full cycle of a blue line tile fish recreational season. So something to think about as we're continuing to move forward with our outreach efforts, those sorts of things. Um, but towards Garfo, I'm curious if you guys have any, you know, direct plans on out education and outreach moving forward, kind of like Dewey was hitting on. And one of the things I'm specifically interested in uh, we say that we have the emails from all of the permitted vessels. I think that's kind of like the honeypot here. We know who all of these people are. We can directly, you know, target our outreach efforts to the individuals with those permits. And I think outside of obviously the non-compliance aspect, it, it seems to be more of a, an education and outreach sort of thing. We have a lot of resources on the council webpage, but I think reaching out to those individuals directly would probably, um, you know, be a productive way to try to move forward. So just curious if you have any plans on that, that, you know, the council and staff could work on uh, with you guys. Uh, we don't have uh, firm plans right now as the next steps on, on outreach. Uh, I think, uh, I, I'm not my own, not firm knowledge, I think a lot of our outreach right now is targeted on, on the transition to the EVTR, you know, on the commercial side as well. But I think you're right that that, that is an opportunity uh, and, and I do welcome the, the council's help in, in getting that word out. So I think uh, we will be formulating uh, approaches to outreach going forward and, and I'll, I'll be in touch with you, I know, to, uh, to work on that. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Um, thanks, Matt. Uh, Scott, did you have something you wanted to offer still? Your hand's still up. Now, Mike, I'm sorry, but since, since I left it up by mistake, I'll, I'll just chime in. I'd, I'd like to be a part of any of that outreach stuff, um, especially here in Maryland. You know, my site is very popular. I get a million hits a year and I've got 30,000 plus um, followers on Facebook, so I can get the word out pretty quickly about anything that's going to be Ocean City related. Thanks. Okay, great. Appreciate that, Scott. Uh, Kate Wilkie. Mr. Chair, I, I was just curious, I know the council has a new outreach committee. Is this the type of issue that they would be willing to take up or is the charge of that committee focused on something different? Well, I would say that, yes, this is this is a, exactly what I, I think that they would take up. Um, I could ask Chris. Who's had more conversations about this new committee with staff than I have? Um, get his thoughts on it. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I would agree. I think this would be the perfect project for them. Yeah, it seems seems like a great opportunity. It seems like uh, there's some council members who who have some ideas on on outreach and um, a real opportunity here. So. Yeah. Again. Yeah, I would. Thanks. I would totally agree. Yeah, and there's a new AP that has been formed as well uh, to help, you know, those individuals can certainly help get the word out too. So, yeah, that's something we'll certainly have to take under consideration. Um, sounds like a good, good thing for them to work on. Thank you. Um, okay, any other members of the council have anything that they want to ask of John or Doug? Any comments? Okay, seeing none, um, I'm going to go to the public. Let's see who we've got here. I've got Fred, Laurie, and Steve. Let's start with Fred. Go ahead, Fred. Hey, good morning. Um, Fred Akers, I'm on the uh, Tilefish AP, and I was looking for a correlation between the Tilefish permits and the HMS permits. And I would I would bet that almost everybody that's out there has an HMS permit. And I would suggest, I think this may have been done already, but I would suggest that there should be a reminder posted some way when people apply for HMS permits to remind them if they're gonna fish for tile fish to get the tile fish permit. 
That's my comment. Okay. Um, we can try to do that. Appreciate the comment. Um, next, I have Lori. Is that Lori Nolan? Yes, it is, Mike Luisi. How hey, are you? Lori. Chairman? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Um, Great. It's a beautiful day in Montauk. What can I say? <laughs> Great. Um, all right. I just, um, first, I'll say on the table that's on the screen right now, the EVTRs and landings by state. Uh, it just seems since this is covering blue lines and goldens is my understanding all these presentations. So it just seems in the pounds column, it would be nice to differentiate golden from blue lines and somehow be able to see where the effort is and what the pounds and, you know, what's going on in the individual fisheries rather than just giving it to us in a cumulative matter um, so that you know, you know, when you're looking at this stuff, are we talking about blue lines or are we talking about goldens? Um, and then the other thing is on the first two tables that we looked at, um, the first, no, the second and third slide, when we're looking at total permits. So, on this table, it says the total is 814 when you go from Maine to Florida. And then on the next table um, that you showed us, you eliminate and you, you shrink it down, New York to Virginia, and we're still looking at 814. And so I just, because I'm home and I have my calculator, all the tallies across the bottom on this table are off. Um, those numbers are all lower than what the screen shows. Seven forty nine is the is the first is the first column, for instance. Just so that it it didn't make sense to me that we still ended up with eight hundred and fourteen permits if you shrunk um, the number of states we were looking at. So all those numbers across the bottom are a little bit higher than they really are. And as Dan mentioned, and everyone is talking, you know, the outreach, I think, is very important here because we all know um, <clears throat> from talk on the dock, from vessels offshore, talking on the radios and stuff, everybody knows um, that there's a pretty good chance there was more effort than is displayed in the reporting. And I get it. It's new. I just am very supportive of an outreach program just to try to gather those who aren't reporting or those, and, and I'm not saying any of this is deliberate. You know, this is a new program and people just need to realize what their obligations are. Um, so that's about it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Laurie. And thanks for picking up on that. I'm sure it was just an oversight when, uh, when they were putting these tables together, but we'll, I'll ask John and, and Doug, I'm sure they'll fix those for, for future presentations uh, as they provide them to either us or, or others. So uh, thanks for your comments, Larry. Nice to hear from you. Um, next, I have Steve Doctor. How you doing, Steve? Good, Mike. Thanks. Um, I got a couple comments here about um, compliance and then also maybe some suggestions to improve it somewhat. Um, when these guys come back from tile fishing, they're getting in late at night and I think the last thing on their mind is to fill out the VTR, which is unfortunate, but um, to, to move forward, um, when you get a hunting permit for uh, migratory birds, you have to fill out a survey on your, on your activity the year before, how many times you hunted and how many birds you killed as far as ducks. And then if you say that you're going to hunt for them again the next year, they send you a log where you put in the day that you hunted and how many animals you killed that day. And you send it back in at the end of the year. So you get a check in the beginning of the year, <clears throat> letting you know that they're going to ask you at the end of the year how much activity you had. And then at the end of the year, they you get actually a reporting. And these guys only tile fish maybe 10 times a year. So, I mean, a one-page log, they could report everything they got. And I'm not suggesting that this will be a replacement for it, but maybe a check. And then also, you know, it will reinforce to them that they have to report. So thank you.
Mike, I think you're muted. Oh, thanks, Chris. Once a day, I figure I, I let myself make a mistake doing that. Um, yeah, so thanks, Steve. I appreciate your thoughts. Um, you know, it's it's that I've heard that I've heard that suggestion before. Um, you know, maybe John or or Doug have a comment about where this is going. Um, I know that electronic reporting is kind of the pie in the sky down the road uh, instead of paper type log books. But you know, a log doesn't have to be on paper. It can be it can be electronic as well. So I appreciate your thoughts, Steve. Thank you. I don't know if John or Doug have any any comments back. Oh, I, I I could just say we'll. I think a survey is something we can consider and, and look into. I know there are you know PRA concerns or other issues that come up when you try to survey folks, but that is uh, one thing I think we've started to consider, and, and we'll we'll think about whether we could reach out to people and and see if they can an alternate way they can also tell us how much they fished. Doesn't uh, depend strictly on the the EVTRs they send in, so that's a good suggestion. Thank yeah. you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. Before I come back to the council, anyone else from the public have anything they want to ask or any comments they'd like to make? Yeah, I don't see any at this time. Let's bring it back to the council for the last few comments uh, before we break for lunch. I've got Michelle Duvall. Excuse me, Michelle Duvall first. Um, go ahead, Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just thanks to um, uh, the presenters for the information. I guess maybe just two questions. One, hoping that we can get a copy of the presentation um, after this. And then just following up on Matt's suggestion about, you know, contacting folks, permit holders by email to try to do some of that, you know, compliance assistance and outreach. I was also curious about the, you know, the, using the apps for that as well, you know, um, through notifications, you know, we all have lots of apps on our phones that, uh, you know, pummel us with notifications. And I'm wondering if there's a way to program the apps to allow for that, you know, at the beginning of the season, maybe, you know, uh, at least like once a month through the season or every couple of weeks, you know, like, don't forget to fill out your top fish reports. I mean, I know it's a 24 hour reporting period, but I think, um, you know, if there's a way we can use the technology to also help with that as well, that'd be great. Thanks. All right, thanks, I'm, Michelle. I'm not aware of any uh, sort of push notification options in the apps, but that may just be my own unfamiliarity with them. So that's something that we can, I can check with our, our folks who know more about the apps than I do and, and see if that's an option. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, I have Dan Farnham next and then Dewey, you're up after Dan. Go ahead, Dan. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. Um, I, I think these are all good comments, good suggestions. <clears throat> I also, I, I want people to understand, I'm, I'm actually pretty excited about this program. I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea. Um, I, I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, increased participation and compliance. And, and in my mind, this is the future here. And I think we, you know, it's, it's a good start. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dan. Dewey Hemelwright, you get the last word here. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I agree with all, all the comments that have been spoken more, uh, educational outreach, uh, using, uh, maybe their email addresses to send them some notification and stuff like that. Cause it, it, it's going to take some more legwork on the ground. Um, and also, uh, um, you know, with Scott's, uh, uh, outreach and stuff like that, Scott Lennox, uh, I, I think it could, uh, you know, next year you could see improvement. Thank you. All right, thanks, Dewey. One last call for anyone from the council that has anything they want to offer at this time. Yeah, can you hear me, Mike? I still hear you. Yep. 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 I also like to uh, say that it it is uh, sunny, and fifty degrees in uh, Aaron, Saskatchewan. Oh, it's nice. Very nice. Well, enjoy it. You. I'm going to give you a long lunch break so you can go outside and enjoy it a little bit. Thank you. Um, all right, I don't see any other hands at this time. Uh, John and Doug, thanks so much for being here with us today to provide us the information that you did. Um, there definitely was a, a lot of interest in, uh, in your presentation and coming up with some ideas for how to get this word out 
Uh, I think this program can only get better over time as more people learn about it and know about it, understand it, understand its importance. And, you know, that falls on all of us uh, in the outreach effort to, uh, to make sure people um, are compliant and uh, with, the, with the rules. And, you know, I just see this becoming bigger and bigger, uh, providing better and better information for us as managers. Uh, as we move down the, down the road. So um, thanks again for being here. Um, we look forward to the next time when we get an update from you guys and uh, we'll continue to stay in touch and work with you um, on how we can better the survey or how we can better the, uh, the information collected uh, through the tile fish permit. So again, thanks. Um, we're gonna go ahead and break now. We, our afternoon session starts out with Colleen and Marissa um, and we're going to give us a presentation on the North Atlantic right whales and uh, I don't want to try to cut. I don't want to try to get back on too early because they're planning a 1 o'clock presentation. So let's go ahead and have, take a little longer lunch. Um, we'll break until 1 o'clock and we'll pick up uh, with Colleen and Marissa on right whales. So see you back here at 1 o'clock. Thanks everyone.